All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. And welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity. We are here to entertain, offend, and defend anybody and everybody. We are a couple of crotchety old farts that have a bad habit of speaking the truth but won't let a few facts get in the way of a good story. We believe in America and Americans. And if this isn't for you, well, then I suggest you change the channel. We still believe in freedom of speech and will rub your face into the cow pie of reality. We will make you scratch your head and maybe scratch your ass. Hopefully not at the same time. <laughs> Without further ado, my co-host, my co-host, no other than the man of men, Don the Predator Fry, and I, his trusty sidekick, Dan the B7. And, oh, and also Don's faithful companion, Quinn, yeah. always making her cameo. Yeah. See how I went. There you go, yes. The, the queen of the ball. Yep, Absolutely. He interrupted her eating her cheesecake. <laughs> oh my goodness! And tonight's special tonight's special guest, the Raging Bull, Manny Fernandez. Yeah. Hey Don, how you, how you been, Don? I've been good, sir. How are you? Up all right, Don. Uh, yeah, good. You know, I had a and rough year last year was a little rough, but you know, so far this year, no hospital tricks. You know, so that's good. Oh, I had a last year. I had. Uh, Hip surgery, knee surgery, eye surgery. Oh, I was telling the VA. I told the doctors, the VA, how much more surgery am I going to have before I get all this done? <laughs> well, we still got to do your neck and your back. I'm like, God, dang. Why don't you just turn me into a, a piece of metal? I got so much metal in me now. Yeah, I got more metal in me than a Yugo. You know? well, well, okay. Well, but Manny, <laughs> Manny I, I mean, I'm glad that those are things that you're talking about right now because the reality is people don't realize they – you know, they, they say, well, you did that professional wrestling thing. And it's kind of like going, and people are like going, well, because I, I always have, like, when I, I travel and I do a lot of these appearances there with Don and stuff like that, I, I have, like, the NWA belt. So I have a professional title belt, but then I have right, right, right. Beside, the, right beside the UFC title belt. So everyone, everyone always recognizes a UFC title belt. They think that's really cool. And then they see NWA, they're like, what does that stand for? And I go, well, it stands for the National Wrestling Alliance. And uh, then I have to educate them as, as what, well. and then the, and I, I tell them, well, it's much like what you see on television. And then, then they always say, well, it, it, you mean that fake stuff? I go, well, don't, don't, don't say the world fake. I said, there might be a predetermined outcome, uh, you know, to it. It's kind of, yeah, you know, right. I, but, but I would say that these, these are some really special athletes telling an incredible story with athletic maneuvers, the way that they're being picked up, the way that they're slamming, crash, bang, boom. I go, most professional wrestlers don't realize that they're doing the most basic fundamentals of martial arts, break falling. They're trying to land on as much body mass as they possibly can so they can dissipate impact. But the reality is they don't always land correctly. They don't always, uh, you have to put your body into somebody else's hands and pray that they know what, what they're doing because if they screw up, it's not them who's going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. Well, you said the magic words there, Dad. Uh, when I started, I you know I'm, I wasn't like most people. I don't know how you got in, but wrestling, pro wrestling came to me when I was playing football at West Texas State University because all the guys that came out of that university were big name superstar pro wrestlers. You know the Funk family and Roger Brody and Stan Hansen, Bobby Duncan. Dusty Rhodes, Dick Murdoch, you, know, you could go on and on. You know, really? Saying, that, all all those guys. people came from that yeah. same area? Yeah, same school. Yeah, yeah one one university. Yeah, we all came from that one. Tully Blanchard. Wow. I mean, it was a bunch of guys. That, I was like you, you know. I, was, I wrestled as amateur most of my life. When I was in high school, I saw two times SPL champion, freestyle all the time. That was wrestling to me, you know. And then when I got into service, went into special forces and stuff and all that, it was a different kind of thing that, you know, like I learned in, in defending myself hand-to-hand -hand combat how to land. It's almost like you say in our wrestlers are, you know, 
in our land. It's just like, you know, martial arts, you just try to take uh, the blow away, and, you know, as far as being tossed, you try to take uh, as much blow away as you can from landing properly. And people don't understand that, you know, it's, we had a motto when, when I started, the old school guys had a motto. This is my life. I put it in your hand and you take care of it. This is your life. You put it in my hand and I take care of it. That's how they worked. Yeah. Yes. They knew that was their livelihood. That was their livelihood, you know? And back in the day when I started to meet these guys, you know, even Andre the Giant, when I first met him, I thought it was, a, you know, I was like, nah, there ain't no giant. No such thing. A guy can't be that big. And the first time I set eyes on him, I said, holy crap. Damn, this guy is big, you know. But, you know, these guys believed in the rusting that had to be put on in the old days was 80% go and 20% show. They went hard at it. Guys like Lou Daz and guys that I, I got to meet when they finally convinced me, hey, this is good for you. You might be good at this. You need to try this. These guys were legit. They were legit. You know, just like you, you could get out there and somebody tried to be smart, but tried to uh, sucker punch you, or, or we called it a potato. Guys that knew how to rest him back, you could take the guy down and cross face and break, chicken wing him and break his damn shoulder. Separate his shoulder. You know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, oh. the, way the, you know, that's the way the old guys, when you talk about the old guys, that's the way they educated the young guys. You know, I didn't just get into the business. I got educated. I got educated the right way. There, if you mess up, kid, you're gonna get tore up. Old well, did you? When, when, you know, when, when, when did you first get involved in professional? So what was it? Was it after your military service, or was it? Yeah, I came back from uh, Vietnam and I had struggles. Had the okay. struggles, and then my parents and my mom convinced me to go back to playing football. So I went back to play. I did. Oh God, I took a long way around. I went back to playing football at West Texas State, uh, all American there, and you know, I, football and wrestling was my game. I became a good football player, all American football player, because of wrestling. Wrestling, amateur, freestyle, and all that high school, you know, uh, folk style in high school, it taught me balance, taught me quickness. Yeah. It taught God when I was an offensive guard, I would. Flipper guy, side flipper guy, turn his ankle, pick him, and roll him over. <laughs> I always beat him. Because, you know, it was like tying up an ankle picking a guy, bringing forward ankle picking. I would just hit him with a flipper and ankle pick his far ankle, and you take him down. And they always accuse me of holding him. But, you know. Well, well wait, but, but you, you've got, I mean, you, any, of the, any of the true gritty NFL uh, coaches. They they go after football players if they've got a wrestling background and they're playing football too. Oh, they want they want that cat more than anything because they know how to handle themselves and uh, and they they know that they may not always go upstairs. They may simply just know enough just to take take the legs out from underneath someone and clog up that hole so no one's no one's gonna run through it. So exactly that's that's how I ended up spending a couple of years on the Kansas City Chiefs taxi squad. They Back in the old days, it was a taxi squad, now it's a practice squad. You know, that's why, you know, I only lasted a few years. I was only 36 foot, you know. But I had, like, just like uh, Dan was saying, <laughs> I could go in and pummel you. I could, I could pluck you on path block and I would pumble you. Right. I'd go inside and pummel you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and just, trip, you know, Don, you pummel inside, grab a guy's for, for elbow, boom, you toss him over. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's, what I had tribute to wrestling taught me how to do that. The quickness and sprawling and everything like that. Quick on my feet and recovery, I was going to get right back up. It's just like a sprawl, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, tribute to that. It got me to that position. And it got me to meet uh, in 1977 when I was playing ball. All these guys, you know, I was, you know, I was the kind of guy who grew up in the Barrios in California. And you know how tough it is. In California, you know, the body was not at all yeah. gang idiots and all that. But back in my world, when I was young and, you know, six, growing up in there, it was body. It was tough guys and you had to be tough. But, you know, you learn how to use your fists and I learned how to play football. Right. And I learned how to wrestle. That was more fun. But I also learned how to kick your butt if I had to. You know, <laughs> you know I, I had eight brothers and sisters and I was the oldest boy. So you weren't going to touch my brothers and sisters. 
that's one thing, you know, I was taught right off the bat. You're not going to touch my brother. I don't know what you're Vietnam for. <laughs> I was uh, there. We, I did evac six months. Six months? Six months. To get out of there, yeah. Yeah. I think I did you, did you went back yeah, to play football? Yeah, I went back to football. That's what got me straightened out a little bit, even though some of the guys, if Terry Funk was, uh, was in a better shape, could tell you stories about me at West Texas State. There's still I love stories Terry. to tell, you know. I love Terry. Yeah. yeah. Terry. <laughs> I visited him and uh, they was... took him from me. Yeah. You know, uh, they took him from me, Don. I used to go visit him in the nursing home. We had fun. Yeah. And I went back to the nursing home where he was at in Amarillo and he's gone. Sure. And I can't get anybody to tell me to, he won't answer his phone. I don't know if he's still alive or All I right. pray God he is, you know, but. I can't get to his home. I can't. He won't answer his phone. The people at the nursing home can't, won't give me any. And you know, well, you have to talk to family. I say, well, you need to give me the number to, to, to uh, his daughter. You right, know? And, right. But but his daughter is the one that's that's uh, kind of working against him. He's really would tell me, you know, things. But really? that's personal things. He would tell yeah. me, yeah. He's the one that put him there and everything. And Terry said it's all about the money. You yeah. know, that's what it always comes down to. Yeah, you know, sure which does. Is sad, sure the fuck which is does. Sad, but that's who I met. In 77, you know, I was running. We were jogging. We had the offensive line, the fat guys, as we call them back then. The offensive guys used to have to jog to pump a little bowl, which was our stadium where we played at. It was about two miles, two-mile jog or whatever. And we had to go right through the Double Cross Ranch. It was a side road. We rode through it. That was Terry Post Ranch. Yeah. And, you know, Terry was a big booster, big time, but he still is. Him and Dory still big boosters at West Texas State, even though Terry, you know, I don't know where Terry's at now. But I just pray he's still with us. But they were big boosters, and Terry would ride his horse on purpose and jog it up and start yelling at everybody, you know. <laughs> so I was jogging alongside of Kelly Kaninsky, who was Gene Kaninsky's son, yeah. who used to be the world champion, whatever. Right. And and I was jogging alongside of him, and I said, who the hell is that effing idiot yelling at him? <laughs> and Kelly Kaninsky, <laughs> Kelly Kaninsky threw a fit. He was like, oh, my God, don't you know who that is? Oh, my God, don't you know who that is? Okay. I don't give a damn who that is. He ain't got no right yelling at us. Riding a horse. That's how I got introduced to Terry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and... and uh, Terry and Dick Murdoch became really close friends of mine. And Terry and then Dick Murdoch would take me to bars, especially Whiskey River, and I'd get in good bar fights. And they, they were, yeah. they loved it. Yeah. They would do it on purpose. I finally, I finally woke up and realized, <laughs> oh, these guys are just doing this on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find out, to find out if I was tough as everybody said I was, you know? Yeah, Terry's one of my favorite. <laughs> Terry's one of my favorite people on the planet, man. He really is. Yeah, well, well he, great one. He picked a he, great one. He, he made, he, he trusted me enough, and that's how I got into it. But, you know, I've always known what wrestling was, so I never, they understood that I wasn't, you know, I would protect it. Yeah. If you said something like Dan was saying that people say it's fake back in, when yeah. I grew up and I was starting, Smash and I was in a bar and somebody come up and say it was fake, yeah, he, I showed him it wasn't fake. Yeah, I put I showed him it wasn't fake. Yeah, anymore. absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to think uh, that, that, that there's a television scene where, uh, why, was it uh, was, was, was it Andy Kaufman that got slapped down or something like that? Uh, there was a scene on, on, uh, with the talk show host. And where, where yeah, it, it, when he was working with um, Jerry the King Lawler. Yeah, they were on the Tonight Show, and so he's he's building heat, you know, for their for their match, and uh, he you know he called it called it fake, and he threw coffee um, on him, you know, slapped him, and yeah, uh, it's a it's pretty good, pretty good work. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> did you like that? Yeah. God, did you really like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I kind of thought it was I kind of thought it was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I liked it. I thought it was funny. <laughs> you did, yeah, it was funny. It, uh, to me, it was funny, but I got no, this dude. 
That's it. If he got clotheslined by anybody else, he'd kill him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's lucky. He's lucky Hampton or Bodie didn't clothesline him. Oh, Those guys don't. Like oh him. my God! I, I see the like the lariat that he throws. Oh. <laughs> oh gee, I was in Japan with they. For whatever reason, the West Texas guys, Brody Hanson, Duncan, Rhodes, and all them, took a real liking to me because of Terry. Terry told him, this guy's nuts. He will fight you <laughs> in the drop of a hat. He would, this guy's nut nuts. <laughs> and I was like, thanks a lot, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. So everywhere I went and in every territory, back in the territory days, everybody was like, we already, we already know the story. Then going like, what story? What are you talking about, man? I'm just here to do <laughs> make territory money. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> the story, but, you know, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you know, Andy, Andy Coffins just made the WWE Hall of Fame. You know that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's what they call the Hall of Fame. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, yeah, I can tell people, hey. Well, I was very fortunate to to be in my high school wrestling hall of fame. Yeah, now, that's kind of to me legit. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. kind of to me something legit. You know, it was just that, and yeah. you know, they put me in all these small time wrestling. Like a month ago, I went to West Virginia. I was in their hall of fame and hall of fame in Texas. You know, you know that's just okay. Thank you for the plaque. I appreciate it. Yeah, I acknowledge that. But from day one, I know what wrestling is. But I, you know, I did my job. But I was told, and I drew a lot of money, so I was one of those outlaws. I, you know, I wasn't a yes man. I wasn't going to kiss your ass. If you watch the videos of me in the ring, half the time I was beating up people yeah. because that's the way I wanted to run. It's like the barbarian. You know the barbarian? I met him, shook yeah. his hand eight years, yeah. ten years ago. Yeah, he, he had a funny video about a month ago, and they asked him about me. He goes, oh, and Fernandez, he, he just beat up people. He didn't care. He just beat up people. He was hard on people. <laughs> hey, it's supposed to be believable. That's what they taught me. Yeah. Be yeah. believable. Yeah. That's... Well, you know, I, you know, the chest, the back, the legs, everything else, where I can forearm you, chop your clothesline, never punch you in the face, never in the cross, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, never in the cross. Uh -huh. And everything else was game to me. You know, it was game to me. <laughs> I let you know I was there. You well, know, yeah, I just, I didn't like all that. I was just, I was just terrible. I was terrible. I was just too stiff, you know. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I worked, I worked a tight, a stiff, a stiff match, you know. And uh, that's what they wanted, but apparently they didn't tell, they didn't tell workers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the funny part about that is, Dan has the Bruiser Brody, all those guys, Abdullah Butcher, all those guys, Murdoch, all them big guys that went to Andre, they went to, to Japan and worked. Mm -hmm. I was the only one that the Japanese call cemento. <laughs> you, man, you sound used to mento. Oh, they, they call me stiffy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's it. But that's good for the business. Yeah, well, I that's thought I so. Yeah. Thought. yeah, I you thought know? so, yeah. It's good for the business, you know? Somebody will doubt you, you know? If, you, if you're there and, you, and you're believable, then you can go and relax and, and not worry about idiots coming up to you in a bar and say, oh, you're fake, and then you got to punch them, which... I'll tell you a real funny story. And this is why the guys that I love so much that some are not with Murdoch and he's gone and Mulligan is gone. The guy just started me in the business. They beat, they, they beat me up, I should say. They beat me up, but they top. Right. <laughs> but they beat me up in the process, right? Right. <laughs> Learning me how to be this thing. But, you know, I got it. In the, it was me. Let's see, Matt Bourne. Remember Doink the Clown, the yeah. original? Yeah. Matt Born with him. And he's another tough son of a that guy was a tough cookie and and you know, outside of the business. You know, he could get down in a bar fight, but it was me and Matt Bourne. I keep I think it was the referee Fonzie. We we're in a bar in Charlotte, uh Plum Crazies it was called. And then guy kept running run his mouth, running his mouth. I finally got tired of it. But we knew the bartender, so he was kind of being cool. With us, goes, come on, we'll try to calm him down. And he was trying to shut the guy up, but the guy didn't shut up. So I finally went over and I punched him out. Mm. And bam, bam, he, was, well, he called the cops. Cops came up. 
Oh my God. And the cop comes into the bar with a canine. Yeah. With a dog. And of course, you're not going to mess with a canine. Fuck no. You won't no. tear your butt up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll tear your butt up. Yeah. <laughs> You when that boy and gets on all fours and starts barking at the dog. Oh shit! Oh my God! You kidding me? <laughs> oh shit! Wow! Oh, he starts barking at the dog, man. I'm like, God dang it! And I started the cop want to know what's going on because the cops just started where in the, where WCW or Mid Atlantic was based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They all knew the wrestlers, and they all knew the wrestlers got into shit all over town, you know. Just, mm -hmm. So the cops already knew coming in, so they asked him what happened. I told him, well, he said wrestling was fake, so I hit him with a fake punch, and he took a fake bump, and then he started <laughs> fake bleeding. So it was a bunch of fake stuff. <laughs> the, cop just, the cop just shook his head and started laughing. He goes, that's it. We're out of here. <laughs> Oh, damn. We used to do some, back in the day, we did some off-the-wall stuff that we got away with. And probably today we'd be under the jail. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but it, you know, it was fun. I mean, I had a great time. And I'm glad you guys got to set. I know you guys competed. Like, I know how hard you guys competed because I competed in folk style and freestyle all my life. I know uh, Dan was Greco. One thing I could never stand is Greco. Cause I love using my legs. I love binding people and stuff. When I was younger, when I raised 191s, I used to love buying. Back in the 70s, you got to remember, they would just take the biggest guy off the football team and throw him in there at heavyweight and just muscle the guy to the ground. Right. He didn't have to learn. But I learned I learned technique from wrestling our lighter weight, or 125s, 135, 140 pounders, even the 95 pounder back in my <laughs> Because they were so quick and they could move and they could get around and take you down and everything. So I thought, man, why not learn from them yeah. and go up to your way and wrestle, you know, learn all the moves from them and all the techniques. And the big guys just want to muscle you around and push you around and then they blow up. Right. When they blow up, you just hook them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just hook them, you know. So that's what I learned. And you, you guys learned that and, and you guys adapted that, that shoot style from uh, UFC into your professional style, but you kept yourself real. You kept it real. Yeah. That's what I was telling about Dan at the, uh, at the banquet. He took something, you know, and made it real believable. He transferred from what he was into professional wrestling and kept it real. That was important. That was the important part. Well, that yeah, I just, I mean, a lot of times it's just wearing the same outfit and just going through a lot of the same motions and that. But, you know, there would be... I always said that I wasn't trying to be stiff with people, but I was I was snug. I always said I always told people that uh, you're never going to get hurt by me. You could be uh, you could be safer than if if, uh, if you were being cradled in your own father's hands right there, because I was always I was always cautious about that. But I definitely was snug. I definitely was snug. So, well, there's see, there's nothing wrong with that, and a lot of people used to come and tell me. You know, and Dusty used to get on me when Dusty was a booker. He'd get on me and say, hey, man, you guys are saying you're being a little too stiff. I said, well, <laughs> that's the way I am. I ain't going to change what I am. But, you know, if they don't want to work me, that's fine. They'll be somebody else. Right. You know, that's up to you. You know, I'm making you money, so you need to just yeah. deal with it, you know. You know, if I couldn't put butts in the seat, then that would be another. It's, hey, there's one. When I was booking and, and uh, had to book in control of South South Atlantic Wrestling out of Charlotte after WCW moved to Atlanta. The clock had sold and moved to Atlanta. I took over South Atlanta as the booker in the Ken Shamrock or Ben Torelli, as I know him, came in and, you know, he came in and I was going to use him as my top guy because his background, but he wanted to do all that. I said, dude, that's, that's not going to work. You got to have a little more charisma. You got to have a little bit of passion. You can't always go out there and smoke the guy. And do that hoist gracie crap. And you just grab a guy in a hole and sit there forever. That's why UFC changed the rules and decided, yeah. hell with all that deal, let's just punch it out. <laughs> so you punch it out. But, you know, I said, come on, man. And, you know, he just couldn't get, he never got the grip of it. He never got the hang of it. You know, the, when he was with me and I had him, I wanted him as my top guy. But he just wouldn't understand. And he would try to argue. And I said, dude, you're arguing with the wrong dude. I don't give a damn what you know. We just step outside and finish this. You know, I don't give a damn to check my ass, but we'll just step outside and, and decide what the hell's going to happen. I mean, 
So he didn't stay long with me. He stayed a couple months and he took off. He went back to UFC or whatever it was called back then when him and Hoyce Gracie was laying on the ground just in boring to death. <laughs> boring. I know it was a two, but it was boring as hell. Yeah, when you guys got it, Dan, Dan put a stop to that shit. Dan, Dan came in yeah. and changed that real fucking fast. <laughs> no, that's what I mean. That's what I love. That's Dan took it and made it something. You know, <laughs> that's what I was trying to tell him. I said, you took another thing, bought a dark sport, but kept it real because you changed the UFC from that boring. I got you in this Hoyt Gracie old player, and I was like, geez, I hate this. Now right. it's like, oh, really, dude, kick his ass, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, now I could just watch and enjoy, you know. Mm-hmm. Never you guys get bored, I don't know what. But that's a, wrestling the same way now. It's like, you know, I was reading the, uh, uh, the last time I talked to Terry was at Christmas. So I went by Christmas, uh, well, the week before Christmas, spent a little Christmas time with him. And that's all we talked about, he says can't stand watching wrestling. You can't stand seeing it. That's when he was a little more coherent. And he said, you can't stand it. It's going to, it's going to hell. It's just not coming back. It's just too much flip-flopping and stuff like that. And I, and I was telling me, yeah, I know. You know, and uh, then after listening to that, I saw that Bret Hart video where he talks about modern wrestling. And I've been saying this for years. It's just no, there's no stories you tell. You're just out there yeah. living plow. You watch that AEW crap, and those guys try to outflip everybody, break your leg, you get killed, you know. Yeah, and there's no breaking story your leg lines. Makes real. Yeah, there's no, no, no storylines. No storylines. You just want to, you know, like you say, flip and flop, you know, and, and see who yeah. could make the biggest, the highest jump, you know. Yeah. How many stem, how many more tables can you stack on top? Right. You can do a little flip and then the guy break. And the funny part is, and, and you know, and I laugh. I said, "You're an idiot." He breaks his leg. You're an idiot. Yeah. And this is just what you get. You know. Now you're you out do, for three. You're, you're out for three months. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Or longer. Maybe you you're done. Maybe you're done. Maybe you never know. You know. And this, you know, it's like I told a guy one time. He said, "Well, I'm a high flyer." I said, "Good. Fly all over the place." I said. I could drop you right between the eyes and knock you out. What's that difference? Yeah, <laughs> you, you had a you had a hell of a tag team, you know, run, and you had a lot of great tag team partners. You know, Hector Guerrero and Rick Rude, and you all beat the Rock and Roll Express. You know, for the NWA World Tag Team Titles. You know, how, how, how did you like uh, singles or tag team better? You know. All the guys that I had, Hector, Hector and Rude, I loved the most. The one I hated was being, you know, I was Dusty brought me in. Dusty wanted me to be his boy. Dusty me wanted me. But Manny, Manny Fernandez, not a kiss ass. Oh, my God, Brown knows you. You don't want to use me on top? That's fine. That's your loss, my mind. No, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be who I am. I go to bars, I party, I fight. That's who I was. Yeah. That's who I was until, you know, Later on, I realized I was diagnosed with PTSD. And to me, I was just an angry person, and I like to go out, have fun. And Dusty didn't like that. He wanted me to go be with him. Oh, let's go over here. Oh, you know, let's all hang out and everything. It's just not my scene. It wasn't my scene. So the partners I had, one of the best was me and Rick Rude got along for one reason. Rick Rude came, and he was still kind of green. And they were telling me, and Dusty didn't know what to do with me because we just dissolved the world. Me and Dusty just broke up as being world tag team captains. Okay, you're going to lose about good. I'm happy. Who don't want to lose it to you? I don't care. I don't care if I ever have a belt. That never bothered me. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It exactly. didn't mean crap to me half the time. The one time I got in trouble because me and Dusty <laughs> were world champs, and I left the, t- the world title belt. And the conveyor belt in uh, O'Hare Airport in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to call, they called Crockett Promotions and tell them, hey, we have one of your belts. <laughs> you know, but that was, I got in trouble for that. So we just saw that tag team with brother Dusty. We didn't know what to do with me. And I was just being me. I beat up this guy, beat up that guy, whatever. So he decided, Rude came in from Memphis and Rude was still on the green side. We're still learning how, you know, not to be so stiff, which didn't bother me. He wasn't wrestling me. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we decided, well, Manny's always being an ass. Let's put him with Rude. They probably won't work out, but something we could at least do to get Manny something and give this new guy something. They didn't realize that we were going to mesh so good. They didn't realize it because Dusty was always saying, well, Manny, Manny will be the worker and Rick Rude will be the gimmick. Let's just gimmick and Manny will go out there and have all the matches with everybody. And, you know, it'll just uh, have uh, Manny settle down for a while. That was their way of trying to settle me down for a while. They pulled me to Rick Rude in the first day that we met each other. It was like, like we knew each other for years. Mm-hmm. I just told hey, I'm in the doghouse. I did it, dude. I'm in the doghouse. I've always been in the doghouse. Dusty keeps me in the doghouse. So maybe this is a good thing for you or a bad, bad thing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so we went out. We had we got together, and I told him, I said, look, according to them, you're still kind of green. So if you don't mind, listen to me. When we're tag teaming, listen to me, you know. And you know what? You listen to everything I told him. He did almost everything. Everything I told him, he, oh. he was just, he listened. It was like, dude, you finally got somebody who wants to work and listen and learn. Yeah. I taught him the things that were taught to me. Everything that was passed on to me by these Terry Funk and Dory Funk, Murdoch and Mulligan and Andre and all these people that were involved in grooming me, I passed on to him. This is the way we were. We became a hell of a tag team. Made just jealous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had these great matches. We had unbelievable matches with Rock and Roll Express all over the country, all over the country, all over the place. Now we just poured a house down, you know. And then we were we were going our Broadways, our Broadways, Damn. and I was in there. Me nice. and Morton would work our butt off. I mean, if you saw the match that we beat them on TV, me and Ricky Morton doing all the work. We're working our butt off, working our butt off. <laughs> <laughs> One time in uh, Philadelphia, we went on Broadway in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I was in there. Me and Ricky Morton must have been in there for 47 minutes. We were going out and <laughs> tagging a little bit. Robert and, and Ruder tag in, tag back out. Tag, me and Ricky going out <laughs> tag in, tag out. So I'm, just, I'm getting tired. I'm hooking them. Go, God dang. Boom, boom, boom. We got the hour Broadway. Go back. People go crazy. I go back and tell Rude, Rude, brother. Come on now. We're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to share a little more time in the ring with me. Me and Ricky were out there for 40 minutes. He goes, uh-huh. uh-huh. <laughs> Remember what Dusty said? He said, I was the gimmick. You were the worker, so you need it. <laughs> <No, it's... laughs> we got along. I mean, that was awesome. You know, that's how we got along. I mean, we got along so great when he decided – to make that decision to leave because he was sick of Dusty's ego, which, trust me, if you ever work with Dusty Rhodes, it's all Dusty, Dusty, Dusty. Everywhere he went, he tore a territory down because it's all Dusty, 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 Dusty. Every angle, Dusty, Dusty, Dusty. And you bring a young guy in there to boost himself up, myself, Magnum TA, whoever he feels could be hot right next to him, he's going to keep right by his side. That's the way he, he was smart doing that. It didn't, it didn't burn him down, nothing. But Rude got tired of that. He got tired of the politics of it. It was all political. If we had Rock and Roll Express with World Champions, we'd be mid-card because us, they had to be top of the card and Ric Flair and all that. And Rude just got sick of it. He told me, wow. I'm here. I called. Cool. Vince wanted to come. I said, hey, brother, we're in this business to make money. Wherever you're going to make money to support your family, go, bro. Go. Well, what do you think about Manny? What do you think about like the like this new internet era though? Now, where I mean, what I like about what you were talking about there is that you can work with the same guy over and over at different territories, and, and literally, the more you work with somebody, you know, you you know better what they're good at, what they're not good at, and you know how to make them really shine, and you you know you know how to interact with them properly to where you don't have to call nothing other than. Just go out there. Who's who's going over, and uh, what kind of a finish you want, and then you know what to call. I mean, you go into some of these locker rooms right now; they lay out this match so detailed. I, I just oh it's like God. it's it's way too detailed. Oh I can't God. remember. I mean, they, they lose me after like the, the second thing. Like, okay, you too too many too many too many spots left and right. And I go, you're 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 uh, you're a heel. I'm a baby face, and and 
so be it. That that's oh, that's what it is. Yeah. But uh, you, you know, know we, we we live in this era of the, of the cell phone, though, and you could wrestle tonight, and you could you could be with the same worker the the next night, but uh, the match might be exposed because there might be someone there that is watching the match, might videotape the match, and literally be playing it. Yeah, I I would have loved to have been involved in professional wrestling when in, when it was the old territory out to where yeah you might be out west for a couple of years and you're right. working with the same group of people over and over again, but because it's a new house or you know you're going one town over, you can have the same same outcomes and stuff like that. But uh, it, it's just a whole different era then compared to what it is now. Yeah, Dan, you know, you hit the point, you know, I was very fortunate when I was young because of Terry. Eight months in professional wrestling, and Terry Funk dropped the Florida heavyweight title to me. Eight months. Wow. I wasn't even a year in the business. Eight months. And the great, one of the, to me, the greatest that ever walked to a ring was Terry Funk to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he did this for me because he told Eddie Graham, this kid can make you money. I'm going to put the belt on him, whether you like it or not. That's my decision. He did that for me. He believed in me. And that wow. was unbelievable. And I had matches with him every time that we went Jacksonville, Miami. And every match was different. Because Terry was un- Terry was somebody who was in the ring, out of the ring, on the street, <laughs> backdrop from a U-Haul trailer into a trailer. Fact, we were fighting on top of a U-Haul trailer and took a backdrop onto a trailer. I'm yeah. like, Jesus Christ, this man is nuts. Yeah. We were on the middle of the street, Armenia Boulevard in Tampa, fighting and cars breaking and stuff. I'm going, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> I'm going to get killed. I went, look, I went from Terry Funk's craziness, and everything was different every town, and then they brought in Harley. Dude, where I learned the most, yeah. they brought in Harley Race. Yeah. I wrestled Harley Race for the world title 15 times. Wow. All through Florida, in every single match, it was one hour Broadway, two 90 minute Broadways, and none of them were ever the same. The only time we had a problem is when I was so excited, I hit, I went to hit him with the flying burrito. He <laughs> said, I will duck and you take your bump. I was so excited that he let me try the flying burrito. I flew so high, I cleared the third row, landed head first, cement first on the St. Petersburg Arena concrete floor oh. and was out for two days in a coma. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. But, uh, it, it, so it's so it's hardly race to take you, and even if it was the same time, you come back, say, eight hours later, you get in the ring and be a whole different match. Yeah. yeah. That's what I learned about the old-timers. Right. It was never the same. It was never the same. You can wrestle like we did. We used to call it the loop. You did a loop with the ball. When he dropped the Florida title to me, I had to do a loop. He went from town to town to town to town to town until we hit every town in the territory for the rematch. And it was still sellout. And there were still different matches. Hmm. And, and you know what it was, Dan and Don? Hmm. It was touch and feel. Yeah. Touch and feel because you knew what was coming. All you had to do was touch him and look. And you know, oh, this means duck, and you duck. Yeah. You didn't have to say a word. Yeah. Never had to say a word. You oh. got that good, and these old timers were that great. Yeah. They were that great. I, I worked with Ming a couple of times over there in Japan, and you know, you had to keep your eyes on him all the time because you never felt him. You know, he was such a soft worker. You know, if, oh yeah. You know, if you took your yeah. took your eyes off of him, you, you you know you wouldn't know what he was doing because he's just so <laughs> so good. So fucking good. Yeah. That's the same problem I had with superstar Billy Graham. Yeah. Superstar Billy Graham, big dude, mouthed up. I mean, he was yeah. a great. Yeah. When he was in our territory, he looked great. And I'd get in there and he front face lock and flip me over, front face lock me. And I go, dude, where are you at? Yeah. I got you, baby. It's okay. I said, no, dude, I can't feel you. You need to tighten up. Yeah. Please tighten up. No, baby. I got you, baby. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stand not feeling you. Yeah. I had to feel you, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, it's like Tony Bunchy goes, and Manny, Manny Fernandez lets you have it. Let him have it right back. Yeah. He's not going to complain. Right. If he hits you hard, hit him hard. Right. He's not going to say anything. 
He's just going to sell and come back and get you again. You just got to keep up with him. And Tully Black would do that. When I whacked the heck out of him, because I used to hate him, yeah. he used to whack me back. And I didn't give a damn, you know, the shit. You know, he was the guy I almost got killed. I got, because of him, I got stabbed eight times. Well, it was me and him. I got a bar fight like an idiot. I picked a bar fight with the Outlaw Motorcycle Club, and I got stabbed eight times. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I told you, I was an idiot. I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, but I, I do. It's understand. a different Dan. Dan is right. It's so different now. Yeah, I sat. I went, you know, to this place that over here. They call it. Uh, what do they call it? Oh, King of Sports Wrestling mm-hmm. over here in Tyler, Texas. They invited me over there. I went over there because one of the guys that I trained when I trained R Truth, Ron Killing, uh, when I trained him, well, Mike Gunner was one of the students too. And he was about to sign and decided to sell off the, the – he was caught in that mix. So I went to go watch him work some of his guys. I went in and redressed and reading, and I'm listening to this guy. And I'm going like, oh, crap. Can you not just go out and wrestle? And they just looked at me all weird like they didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. But they were just going over this and that and this. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you do this and you do that. I'm going like, what the hell? What happened to just grabbing a front face so I can tell the guy yeah. two elbows, one tackle, two elbows, one tackle, get it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to that? You know what I'm saying? Oh. Simple stuff. Oh, man. They, you know? Yeah, they try and line shit up for me. I got a terrible memory. So, it was just, you know, I, I just, I'd be so, so tense, you know, just trying to remember what the hell I was supposed to do that, you know, I'd just be too <laughs> stiff from that, you know? And, yeah, and, that's, uh, and I still get lost, you know, st- trying to remember what the hell to do. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a whole different world. I don't, I don't, I've never, you know, I've never watched wrestling. Never, you know, I don't, I don't have wrestling memorabilia in my house outside of my amateur stuff. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't have pro wrestling stuff. I don't have pictures up or anything. These plaques I get from these people for Hall of Fame induction stuff. Hey, they're in my closet, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're in the closet. My my better half always tells me, "Why don't you ever put this stuff up?" Like, oh, what? I already know what he's all about. I mean, you know, outside, you know, my service and my memorial plaque, my memorial, Vietnam memorial plaque, and my bayonet. That's about what I got in my house. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, you know to this day, to this day, I'm thankful that I met the people I met in professional wrestling. Great people, you, Dan, you know, you guys came in and when it was about the time to take that political change with Vince, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was one thing that I have stand by is when they try to get me up to New York, I just told them I wasn't interested. In, I wouldn't work for Vince. Yeah. I knew that wouldn't last anyway. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, it wouldn't last, so I wouldn't give the guy the pleasure of firing me or I would have walked out. You know, I've never, you know, I've never, in all the years in the profession, in all the territories I worked in, nobody ever fired me. Nobody ever told me. I gave them my notice. Yeah. I'm done here. I'm going somewhere else. Wow. You know, I've had that honor. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't. That's rarity. That's rarity. Yeah. I would I wouldn't let Vince have that honor. Yes, I was him. Because I, I knew the bastard would have fired me anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that was a bit. Yeah. And, you know. You know we, I went up there with uh, Scott Ferrazzo to interview with him. And, you know, you know, Scott was a used car salesman and he told him, well, this is what Don and I going to do. This is how it's going to be handled and we're going to do this and do that. You know, that they escorted us out of the fucking building, you know. <laughs> oh, well, Lord. You know, there's so many. The, the, the thing is, when I was still training guys and I'd get one thing I'd give Vince credit for. Is when I would call up uh, John Cone, the uh, the talent director, whatever they call him. Yeah. I tell him, hey, dude, I got a couple of kids that, uh, you know, you might want to look at. They're pretty good. And because you know, I mentored JBL and and Booker T and Stevie Ray. I trained, I mentored them, and I trained uh, R Truth. And I had so many guys, Homicide, all those guys that were tough guys in there, and uh, a low key mentored all these guys. 
when I told them I had people that would like to come and try out, they never denied it. They always let me in, and, and you know, uh, William Regal always treated me very good. Oh, I, love, he, I, love, was, I love Steve, man. He's great. He's great. Yeah. Yeah, he was he's fantastic, and yeah. he would always, you know, when I came, he would always come up and hang with being there and stuff. He was, he was, he was really good. I mean, he treated my boys real good, but I never, you know, I haven't taken guys in years to try out anymore because I've lost interest in training people because all they want to do is, hey man, when are you gonna teach me how to flip? I, I want to learn how to do this flip. Yeah. I say, well, you're in the wrong school, dude. Wrong, wrong place. <laughs> I said, you're first going to learn how to high C and dump a guy, cross face him, a chicken wing, and try to tip him. <laughs> and they look at you and go, well, what's that? Yeah. 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 No, we would Ma try. Manny, you, you would love, you would love my training facility because they all start up on wrestling mats. They don't, they don't get a chance. They, they actually have to earn the privilege of going into the, the ring and they will start off on the wrestling mats and they have to, pass three blue mat matches now what a blue mat match is it's just a, a a blue mat that's the same size as what a professional Russian ring is but when they step on that blue mat they actually have to be in character and they have to be a wrestle the very first match it's 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 a, a bare bones minimum of five minutes and it doesn't matter who goes over it's that you guys decide amongst amongst yourself and but they have to step on this mat you realize there's no ropes there's no turnbuckles it's just a blue mat, 16 by 16, and they actually have to wrestle, change hold for hold, reversals the whole nine yards. How many how many shows have you been at, Mandy, that a ring rope breaks or something happens to the ring itself? I've actually been at shows before where the ring never showed up. <laughs> and, and now they, and this was at a high school, they rolled out the wrestle mats and all the flyers were like going, what are we going to do? And yet all of my guys and myself were good to go because we know how to wrestle. Yep. You're exactly right. Uh, I've, I've been to the occasion when we used just a uh, high school wrestling mat, but you're doing the same thing I did. I don't allow them in the ring until they're there. Like I could told a guy, I could snatch an arm and get 10 minutes out of snatching that arm and making so many different holes because I learned how to amateur wrestle when I was young. And I can yeah. teach you the same thing so you don't have to worry. Well, how about me doing a cross body or learning how to do a, a, a sunset flip? And I say, well, when you learn how to work a hold, like the old timers used to do, work a hold mm -hmm. and know how to use that hold and work the hell out of it for 10 minutes and, and extend the match where it's going to be 20, 10, 15, 20 minutes, then maybe you can learn all that stuff. Till then, learn how to work in and out of holes. Yes, we're getting this. Working in and out that, of holes. Got a maze. Yeah, that con that continuity of, of you attack you attack that that arm or that back or whatever, and then you know, okay, they might get to the rope or something like this. Okay, the referee takes you breaks you. Okay, but then if you come right back to it again and come back to it again, if people see they see the tenacity that you have. They see that you're you're continuously to attack. Your, your opponent there, and you're strategically keep, keep going after that arm or that leg, or you're weakening that joint. You're weakening that joint. So I guess I think what we're trying me. to say is we're making professional wrestling make sense <laughs> in a, cra yeah. a crazy-ass world anymore. Trying to you, tell a story. You, you're telling a story. You're telling us you're going to try to tear this guy's arm off because you want to take advantage of him there, only being able to use one arm. And you let the guy out. You let the guy out. He breaks it for a minute. Looks like he's going, bam, you get him, boom, you're right back into it. Right back into that severe hole. Right back into the chicken hole. Right into the coffee. Whatever you got to do, you let the guy survive for a second. Looks like the people, oh, he's got a chance to get, oh, no, he's back in it. They don't understand that part of the story. That's what people want. They're sitting there at the edge of the street going, oh, he's almost out. Oh, he's always oh, out. He's out. Oh, he got him back. They don't understand yeah. that part. They have no nobody tells them. They have no psychology whatsoever. They don't understand what the meaning of psychology means. They don't understand. You know, they think that the people want to see uh, triple. Let me see a triple axel. Everything that's good for women's gymnastics. I mean, <laughs> man, that's that's all great. The girls look great doing all that. But 
you know, you're doing all this and the guys are getting hurt and their heads cracked open like kind of broken legs. Oh, gosh, you know, I don't, in all my years of pro wrestling, I never seen anybody break their leg. You know, there was a couple of taters by mistake. I mean, I, even with my flying burrito, I broke somebody's nose a couple. I broke Wahoo's nose, Wahoo McDaniel's nose one time. All he did was break mine back. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't get mad. He just repaid me. Next time he took me over and dropped the cup on me, he dropped it right on my nose. I said, oh, damn, he broke my nose. He started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. I mean, yeah. But, you know, there was mistakes made. There, there was a lot of potatoes that weren't meant, but it happened. So you just get a receipt, and you expect yeah. it. Yeah. You, you, respect it. you expected it, and you respected the guy for doing it. There's no big deal, but you didn't go out there and, oh, my God, I'm going to do all these tables and then I'm going to break your leg. <laughs> what good is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's a believe boy got a broke leg. Oh, well. <laughs> what if that broke leg ends your career? Mm-hmm. You know? They don't realize that. You know? It's like, you know, it's like me. I get frustrated. I, I go to these uh, uh, group meetings for PTSD. I get frustrated. I got service connected for, for the military for my combat service, but they only give me 75% service connected, which I mean, which is good. I get a good, I make a good living. I don't worry about, you know, having to go anywhere to wrestle or anything. I do a couple conventions. I'm going to one next week in Pennsylvania. I mean, New Jersey, four days. But I don't worry that I have to, you know, live on wrestling, keep wrestling like Ricky Bourne wrestling until he's 80. Why you got to wrestle until you're 80? I mean, geez, I mean, after a while, it's just done. You're done. Hey, you know, grab, grab a grip, get a grip on life. You're done after so many years. You're out there, but you're, what, going to be 70 years old, and you're out there beating kids that are 20-something? That's not believable. No. no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's not believable. But see, I get frustrated because because of pro wrestling in my two years of NFL career, I can't get my other 25% from the service to be a hundred percent service connection because of pro wrestling and the NFL, <laughs> you know, that's frustrating. It's, it's frustrating to me because, you know, I think I should be a hundred percent, but you know, I was a pro wrestler for 40 years. I can't right. deny that. Right. You know, I can't say, Oh, I didn't do it. No, I didn't do it. Well, you paid him. I only paid in the NFL for two years. That's not, you know, but that, that counts against me. You know, so, yeah, but, you know, I deal with it. You know, I deal with it. And some people call, I mean, it's like when, when I was at that bank with his dad, you know, I didn't care about those other guys. Yeah, Dory, because Dory was part of it. All those other guys, they didn't give a damn about, you know. I remember uh, J.J. Dillon when I first started pro wrestling in Amarillo having my first match with him. He was so scared I was going to shoot on him, he really didn't want to wrestle me. <laughs> <laughs> And you're going to be in Jersey next week? <laughs> yeah, I want to be in uh, Persephone for a, a convention there, four-day convention there. Me and I think Bret Hart and a couple mm. other people. I forgot who's on there. Yeah. We'll be over there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be somewhere. Like I hadn't seen that. I'll be, you? Yeah, I'll uh, be somewhere. I don't know if that's the same one or not. I'll be somewhere. You'll be in Jersey? That'd be great, Don. Yeah, it would be. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it's the yeah, same one. Yeah, it, it took me, it, you know, I hadn't seen Dan in years until I saw him at that uh, Hall of Fame induction, you know. It's been a long time. I think you it's know, called it's, the so, 80s Wrestling Con. Yeah, 80s Wrestling Con, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's sure. you know, guys, like me and you, guys are leaving. Guys that I love and respected and looked up to in the business because of how they worked and how they protected it, are all gone. Yeah. You know, I got, and I'm afraid of losing Terry. Yeah. I've been with Terry since. Yeah, but I Terry think Terry. 19, uh, huh? I've been with Terry since 1977. Oh, yeah. But I, met him. I think Terry, I think Terry's ready to go. When, when he lost his wife, it just destroyed him, you know? Oh, yeah. I think. I, him and their brother. Yeah, him and Vicky were so close. Yeah, I think he, he was you know, so close. Yeah, I man. think he wants to go. You know, just because of that. Yeah. You know, 
I mean, nobody wants well, him, nobody wants him to go. You know, we're all we're all being selfish. We're gonna keep him, but you know, he, he's not happy here, man. You know, he misses her so bad. Yeah, you might be right because I know how much you love Big Hill. Always with him, and uh, I just hope not. You know, I I owe so much to him, and I tell him every time I see him, if it wasn't for you, I'd be nothing. Why you did what you did, I'll never understand. But if it wasn't for you, I'd be nothing. You know, he just had a lot of faith. Where he got that from, you know, you know, I was just some crazy idiot. But uh, I mean, that would be a hard pill to swallow on my end. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brad yeah, Reagan's yeah. Brad Brad Reagan's broke me in, you know, and uh, Masa Saido, you know, and Kerenik, you know. So, and it, it hurt when we lost. When you lost who? Uh, when lost, um, Kurt Hennig and Massa, you know, Saito. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, oh, yeah, Massa, you know, I he, love that, especially Kurt. Yeah, you know, I say, <laughs> I tell you, funny, Kurt, too, that you brought up Kurt Hennig. They're all funny. Now, the <laughs> hey, hey, we were in Nashville or Memphis or something, and that's when everybody was taking those stupid ecstasy pills. <laughs> yeah. And we love the ecstasy pills, right? And I had Halcyon. My doctor gave me Halcyon. I had a hard time sleeping, right? We were all partying at the bar. And I had Halcyon to everybody's drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody passed out. So I went around and shaved everybody's eyebrows. Yeah. I saved I saved Kirk in his eyebrows and when he was pissed, he was so pissed off when he came to the airport he had two bad legs. <laughs> he he ace bombed me on the, the beginning of a flight over to um uh, Japan and I didn't wake up for two days, you know. Shit. I didn't Oh, cool. You knew about H bombs, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, Kurt was so mad at the airport. And I was like, dude, what happened? I'm telling you, man, them nasty boys got everybody last night. So I'm not gonna <laughs> I didn't think Kirk was going to do what he was doing. He went over and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't kidding you. I ain't kidding you. He was so not, <laughs> not, I never told him the truth. Not, not that these be jacked around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah, that goofy fucker too, out. boy. Brian, Brian yeah, Allen is and, great. Yeah, yeah. But Brian Rangers and me, we had a good, you know, Greg Goddard couldn't stand me because I would always tell him, you're a piece of shit. I don't like you, you're a piece of shit. Yeah. While well, we in Ray Stevens, they're trying to make this territory and they were doing, we were doing good. And then you came in trying to be a hot guy. You're a piece of shit. Jeez. <laughs> and I would just pick on him all the time when I was yeah. in Minneapolis. <laughs> and Brad come in there. And I hadn't met Brad in Japan. Me and Brad had the greatest relationship in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> because Brad was Brad was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And me and Brad were in Japan when they brought brought the Russians over. Hashimika, Sarasa, the Olympic world champion, all them guys that uh -huh. came over uh -huh. to New Japan to train, right? You you know some of them names, I'm pretty sure. And me, me and Brad were like, damn, invader was all paranoid because he didn't know how to work them. I said, just work like you work anybody else, England. <laughs> do not do you. But they didn't, nobody really smartened them up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so the Russians and me and Brad were having fun with them. <laughs> we were trying to smarten them up. So we weren't worried about shooting and them shooting out there. Right? So we were showing them simple moves, top of the like rabbit and, like, and the Japanese caught us and they were pissed. No, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Brad had this good relationship going with Russians, and we had a tag match with us. So me and Brad thought about a work in the Japanese out there. But we had a good match with them. <laughs> so me and Brad became close, right? Yeah. So when Brad come back in Minneapolis territory, Greg Gagne was like, oh, wow, well, I'll just get Brad Rangs and he'll show me. And you know you know how tough Brad is. Yeah. You know how tough. You couldn't even break Brad down. Fuck no. Brad, Brad Rangs is a four-point you're not breaking Brad Rangers nope. down. He was nope. like a fire hydrant. Yeah. He wasn't going nowhere. Yeah. And then, Greg got me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell Brad. <laughs> Brad's going to mess up bad. <laughs> so we get out there. <laughs> and Greg's looking out the door, and he's thinking, oh, yeah, Brad's going to tear Manny up. <laughs> and we tie up like grab a headlock, take him over, and I looked over, and Greg started smiling. 
<laughs> we had a hell of a match. Now, talk about snug. They're snug. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, Brad was ranged as a snug, buddy. Yeah, he he's, could be. He is so powerful, man. Just powerful. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Me and him had fun in Japan and Russia. <laughs> Well, just yeah, the, just the way that Radigas was, was built. I mean, he he just I mean, yeah, he just like a bulldozer. Yeah, you know, the way he's yeah. built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny. Yeah, it was funny, man. We had we had a great great time in Russia. We had, you know, I knew that Brad would take on the Russians, and hey, uh, I got tore up in Russia. The Russians were in Russia, and we were in it. <laughs> I wrestled Thangiyov, and Thangiyov was just ripper. Well, hey. You wrestle the guys that are world caliber wrestler. They don't rip you apart. You know, I just yeah. did a little bit. Was good and great in high school, but in high school, and I did Oakstown, Freestown College because West Texas had no wrestling team. But I could go out and find tournaments and stuff, and and wrestle and stuff, and stay in shape for football. That got me in shape for football. I went around wrestling yeah. most of the time in the summer, but yeah. got me in shape for football. But you know, the same guy was in there in Russia. And, Boom, boom, we had to match, and, and, you know, bam, he turned me up, and finally I said, okay, I raised my hand, <laughs> we're going to hand fight, he raised his hand up, and I kicked him right dead in the nut. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> and I smashed him up, I suplexed the piss out of him, I looked up, I jumped up, I said, oh, there, that's the American way. <laughs> Well, hey, well, and he loved it, and he loved it. The Russians come over and loved it. They brought me vodka. And stuff. <laughs> me and Ben, man, Bigelow, Bigelow got so drunk he threw up everywhere. Oh, <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> well, well Russians, Manny, was, was there someone that you really enjoyed working, or was there like like what was like one of one of the most spectacular matches in in your career, or uh, that uh, I mean, really stood oh out God. to you? Oh my God! You know. I had to, there was so much great talent back then, Dan. All the old timers were so damn good. When they got in the ring with you, they made you shine. It was that damn good. But, you know, matches that I had, like I said, Terry Funk was unbelievable. He can go night and day. He could be plastic, you know, wrestler, pull or hold or everything, or be crazy out in the, out in the street taking backdrops off of that God, U Haul trailer. Boom and all that, running around, beating up himself, and then get on with Harley Race, and then Harley Race and his the way he worked the uh, match, and then go to somebody like Story Funk, who's physical, in and out of holes, every hole, short arm scissors, all the old school, boom, just scientific wrestling from the get go, and all that. I was very fortunate. So, you know, all the guys that I wrestled on top were so good. That I couldn't ever say to anyone, you know, that I had a great one great match with one one superstar wrestler, one legendary wrestler, because they all made me look good. They all did so a job making me look good. <laughs> I just followed their instructions. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They they talked, I listened. It was the greatest line I ever got from Dick Murdoch, who was one of the greatest too, was shut up and listen, kid, and you'll do all right. That's all I ever did. That's all I did. For 10 years, I shut up and listened until I got to the point where I started leading. I started leading, but I used what I was taught from them to lead. I could never say, you know, I wrestled Murdoch, I wrestled Harley. You know, I was tag team partners with Andre and had fun with him. You know, Dick Slater. There were so many, Dory Funk, Terry Funk. You know, there's so many people. Even Bugsy McGraw was great. I mean, Blair, you know, there was so many. One of the best times I had in my life was Don Morocco. Yeah. Don Morocco was one of the greatest guys. In the, he used to put quaaludes in my mouth in the middle of the match. <laughs> by, the time the match by the time the match was over, I'd be like, and he'd be going, oh, yeah, he's selling like crazy. <laughs> wow. Wow. Dude, I, was a, I was a rookie, and I, 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 it was listen to the old timers. That's all you got to do when you learn. And when I once they said, open your mouth, all of a sudden, boom, I'm going, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> but Don Rocco was fantastic. Him, and I had, hey, even big, big early lad. I had some fun matches with early lad. I mean, yeah. there were so many guys when I was a young guy growing up. 
that I was fortunate enough to be on top to work these guys, they were unbelievable. I mean, today you don't have that. You don't have that nurturing. You you don't have a guy who's been in the business and worked over territory and got over in every territory and carry a young kid that they say potential in that they know can make money in the business and make money for the company and everybody around them. Because back in the day, you had to put asses in the seats for the boys to make a payday. They got paid by what, what you brought in. If you were put on top, you were responsible for putting food on the table for everybody on that card. Right. And that's yep. a big responsibility. That's a big responsibility. And, you yep, know, I, I put on my shoulders at an early age. You know, yeah. at an early age, an early time in the business, that was put on my shoulders in Florida. And thank God that, you know, they had that much trust to, to have, you know, uh, probably one of the greatest matches I remember is the one that I knocked myself out was in a coma for two days because I was having so much fun. <laughs> it was so easy. <laughs> it was so easy. The match was going so easy with Harley. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, this is awesome. 40 minutes gone on the match. I go, wow, we went already. I was like, damn, we already went 40 minutes? Jeez, we haven't done anything. And that, that's, that's the main lesson I was taught. Less is more. Less yeah, is more. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. That's the Dan, honestly, that was, today I can't see anybody in this business that could do what these guys did for me. Nobody. You no, know? it's all about themselves, you know. You know? Yeah. And I mean, when I did go to WD, I got the respect of all the guys, you know, they all hey, and you were this and you were that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I appreciate that. You know, it's good respect. It. For a, a guy like William Regal, Steve Regal, whatever, I call him William. Yeah. He'd come up and say, man, it's an honor having you here. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know, hey, hey, man, hey, there is a, if there is a Mount Rushmore of wrestling, who'd you put on it? Gary Funk, Harley Ray, Story, yeah. Nick Murdoch, uh, Andre. You know, it's, 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 when, one of the things I enjoyed working with Andre in Lubbock, Texas, when I was just starting out, is everybody thought that Andre was giant was just a giant that came in and didn't do much of it, you know, but he couldn't move it. Andre the Giant was proud of being a wrestler. Yeah. He would take bumps. He could drop. He could, just, you know, backdrop. He would, Andre, you know, they say, oh, Hulk Hogan slapped him. I seen uh, Andre the Giant get slapped way before Hulk Hogan slapped him. Yeah, you know, I saw Hardy Race do Andre it. Take you know? Yeah, I seen Andre take pride in taking bumps over the top rope, headlocking people, working, working. It was, uh, I'd snatch a hole, tag on the heater, I'd snatch a hole. He'd wait the hole, give it back to me. Boom. I mean, he was, he could work. Yeah, he wasn't just a big monster. He could actually work, and that's what amazed me, because <laughs> I just thought he was a big gimmick. Right, right. You know, he was a, he was a big gimmick that I met when I was a junior in college. That would keep calling me boss, and I could tell him, "No, I'm not the boss. I'm here to pick you up, dude. I'm not the boss of anything." Okay, boss, you take me to liquor store. I go, liquor store? We got to go to Lubbock to wrestle. <laughs> I go, we got to drive 70 miles in Lubbock to wrestle. You got to be in Lubbock. I, I was told to pick you up and take you there. You stop at liquor store, okay? Oh, okay, whatever. He come back with a damn taste of beer and a damn gallon, half gallon tequila. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell is this, man? Hey, look. In college, I had a Formula Trans Am with T-Tops, and I had to drive them in that. I had to pick them up and put them in my car. <laughs> <laughs> and, dude, by the time 70 miles from Amarillo, from Canyon, Texas, where it was based out of Canyon, Texas, even though it was the Amarillo Territory, the office was in Canyon, where I played football. And uh, by the time we got to Lubbock, all the beer and I, you know, were gone. Mm -hmm. I go, this guy's going to wrestle? He's going to be drunk wow. when he gets out of his car. He got out of the car, bro, and he walked straight as a nail, nothing. Nothing. I'm like, damn. <laughs> if I would have done that, I would have been dead. Yeah. But... <laughs> I heard he got on an airplane one time, bought all the booze on the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> Were you on a, I was on a plane with him to Japan, and I'm like, oh, my. And he decided, because 
he knew me since I was in college and, you know, I would drive him around and stuff, pick him up, drive him around, take him to eat and stuff. And uh, so he took me out of business class, brought me up to first class. Brother, he got me so drunk. Mm. I couldn't get off the airplane. <laughs> I couldn't get off the airplane. In Tokyo, man, I couldn't get off the airplane. <laughs> Uh, he was a great man. I had to enjoy him. I enjoyed him. I enjoyed all the old timers, man. I had Dan. I had so much fun with the old timers when I was coming up being green. I mean, all the ribs they pulled on me. Jack and Jerry Briscoe were awesome. I loved them to death. Those guys used to love to pull ribs on me, pee down my leg, and I knew it was coming all the time. But you know, you're a green kid. You just let the veterans do what they got to do. And I heard you. Right. They dropped me off. It's you know, we'd all stop to pee. They'd jump back in the car and take off and leave me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, it, it's fun. It was so much fun right. coming up in that era. Right. <laughs> Nobody got no yeah. feelings hurt. Yeah. That during that, that same time era that you're talking about, that uh, I was first going over to the for the uh, Japanese UWFI organization. That's what uh, Luthez was heading up and Billy Robinson. That's where I ended up meeting both of those uh, gentlemen. And uh, that was a, that, I mean, that was really great for me. I mean, I really, uh, I, I learned a lot just by just sitting back and just, not, you know, get shut up and listen. Yeah. Were they not awesome? Were they not awesome? You know, I, I love Luthez. Luthez, you know, we were, uh, you know, I, I got in the ring, I would work out with some guys and, the dude would be there, and he'd come and get dressed out, cook, and he would just hook me and teach me how to hook and everything. It was so much that he, I wanted him to teach me, but you know, there's, you know, the fans that started, you know, getting that time. But before they came in, and we'd be out in the ring, and Lou was so good, and such a gentleman. He was such a great person, and, and he treated me with so much respect because, you know, he heard, oh, I heard that you came up with the punk. Yeah, I did this. And, you know, but he was an amazing man. I had so much fun learning from him. He was so amazing. <laughs> but I wrestled uh, an old guy. Well, he passed away so many years ago now, so you probably never heard of him. His name was Gino Hernandez in uh, in yeah. Houston, Texas. Yeah. And we had a and when I was uh, working for Joe Blanchard, Tully's dad. I, we went to Houston, and I was the Southwest Heavyweight Champion, and I wrestled Gino Hernandez. And Gino was acting all stupid. He was all coked up before he got in the ring. Oh wow! He got all coked up. That's how he. That's how he died anyway. He overdosed on that. But he was all coked up and got in the ring when he still. I tried to shove him out. I hooked. I hooked him. I said, "Dude, I don't know what you're on, but you're not going to come in this ring and, and do something stupid to her. And I won't tie you up in a knot." So he pissed me off. So I shot in a vine cross, faced him, and they went across. I figure for his waist. Better. Yeah. I couldn't, you know, he was the, just moving and like, just like having a, a fit or, or a spasm, whatever. I couldn't. So I just hooked him. I had him hooked. And I was just choking him hard to get, get out. So to get out, Lou was asking him, and Lou's looking at me going, like, you're, I know you're hooking him. And, and uh, I know why, but we're going to have to wrestle here. And you know, Hernandez thought, well, the only way I'm going to get out of this is I'm going to have to slap the referee and break the hole. <laughs> he reached up his arm, his free arm, and slapped Blue in the face. <laughs> Dude, he slapped Blue in the face. All of a sudden, he was gone. I had nobody. <laughs> he, he was gone. It's like somebody just snatched him up out of an invisible man or something snatched him up. I look up and Lou's got him hooked. <laughs> Lou was pissed. <laughs> Lou didn't like that. I said, oh man, I'm out of here. <laughs> so Gene Hernandez got, he got a valuable lesson. <laughs> you didn't mess with Lou, right, Dan? No, no, again, he was, uh, just, but, but you, you said it straight there. I mean, he's, he was just such a good person. You know, you just, you just want to sit back and just kind of listen to what he had to say. And uh, he had presence about him. So. Yep. Oh, yeah. He was, I got, you know, I'm glad you guys got to meet him if you did. I mean, Dan, I'm, was, I was so fortunate to come up in the area where they were still around and they were still doing, Lou was still doing a little bit of refereeing and 
he'd come over and work with you a little bit and stuff. That was that was an honor for me. I got to meet and work with him, get in the ring with him. Some of the guys, those guys that would teach you, they weren't afraid to teach you. They were, you know, they weren't like, oh, I'm not going to teach him because he's going to hook you. No, they had confidence that you, in themselves, more than anything, and what they taught you was going to hurt them. So that was a great thing about that. Well, well, well Manny, what, uh, I mean, uh, do you have any kind of like social media? Uh, if, if if people are listening uh, to this interview and they want to get in touch with uh, you to book you for speaking engagements, uh, things of that nature, what uh, is how, how do people get in contact with you? No, you know, uh, I don't do all that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have well, time. I'll well, 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 what we, well, well, I guess what we, we could do there, we'll just be, we'll, we'll put something on into this, uh, on into this Toxic Masculinity one, uh, podcast that if anyone that's interested in uh, trying to uh, book Manny her, 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 uh that to simply just to contact, uh, just contact us, and then we'll pass on the, the messages well, then to you. I, yeah, I got that that email. You know, my better half gave me an email a while back. It's it's an easy email, mfragentbull yahoo dot com. You know, it's just that you know, I'm not it that bad. You know, I deal with my my issues. I go into group meetings with the VA and stuff. I still have issues, so I'm not that active with around people. You know, even when I go to church, I have a little private room that I go and pray in and uh, try to stay away from the people, you know. Um, I'm always jumpy. Yeah. <laughs> As I get older, I, I, I get a little more jumpy and stuff. And if you, you come up and spook me a little bit, I start to duck under high sea, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I, one of my famous uh, protections in bar fights is you swing, I duck under high sea, you dump. Right on your head. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. What, what what was that email address? One more time, to Manny. Mfragingbull at yahoo dot com. Mfragingbull. All small letters, little letters. Okay, and you said M Yep, M F M F Raging Bull at at yahoo. Okay. Dot com. All right. Just want. I just want to be on the road. I'll be on the road a little bit longer. You know, I'm just. Yeah, you know, I pick and choose when I want to get on the road. When I when I have good uh, mental stability, yeah, I'll go on the road and meet people. And, they, and the main reason I went to New York uh, to to a convention was I wanted to induct you. You know, so well, let me induct you. You know. And I had gone the year before to, because I inducted Terry and took Terry's ring. I had gone the year before. And uh, when they said you were coming, I said, well, I'd like to induct him. Uh, so no, I mean, no, that, that, to me, that was that was just a real honor. I, I was, I, I actually, I was very happily surprised about that. Yeah. Yeah. It was an honor for me. And that's my the reason I went in. I didn't, you know, that's, Last time I went because I did that for Terry. But, uh, yeah. Why? Well, yeah, I, 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 every I, now and then. Yeah, I, I just simply like the gentlemen that actually that 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 run this because they're they're business they're actually they're business people that are running it, and they're actually running it like a business, and uh, they really and and they, but they all have a love for watching professional wrestling. None of them ever participated into it, but they have a real love for uh, love of it. And uh, they just want to help, kind of uh, save uh, yeah a piece of it, you know. Yeah, so break, break away from uh, they they're doing a good thing, man. They're doing a good thing. They're breaking away from the grip of Vince McMahon and all this. You know, they're bringing in you know legitimate people that I think he's got. He's a he's a good guy. He, he does. He has a good business mind. He does it good. And I hope and they last and keep it going because. You know, at least it's legitimate. You know, you can go and see people with gimmicks and stuff like that. But, you know, sometimes. 
even as you're speaking, even as you're speaking right now, I'm just trying to look look it up right now because I know they got another one that's coming up uh, this coming summer again. I just don't see what the uh, can't see what the date is offhand, or I might have passed it already. But uh, I know that yeah, because I've I've got it written down in my book because I wanted to go. I I liked it so much that I said that I, I would like to help help them out and uh, be a part of it. Uh, you know, good to to help uh, to help yeah, help it, uh, get a little bit more attention. You know. We'll come up with some ideas in that. You know, my my deal right now is, yeah, I've been on the road almost uh, fifty years, fifty years, yeah. and you know, my better half has been waiting for me to stop. <laughs> She's been waiting twenty years for me to stop. I live over here; she lives over there because I can't stand California. It's got too many people for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's just too many damn people in California. Yeah, they're and all see, 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 Don. Maybe you should be taking that as a marital <laughs> advice right now. It works out better when you just are you're you are happier when you're are away from each other. You know, fondness, right. sir. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Dan's right. Don's right. Don, you're right. They're squirrely. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't deal with them people. Mm -hmm. I went there about uh, uh, what in 2015. I wasn't there a month, and I got locked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jail. <laughs> I got out of jail and said, I got to get the hell out of this state. Yeah, yeah. I ain't going to prison. I ain't going to prison for nobody. No. No. <laughs> no, ain't worth, no. Ain't worth it. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. You guys have been great, man. It's been thank an honor talking to both thank, of you, man. Thank, thank you, it's sir. It's an honor. Hope to, you know, I can... Hope to see you over the weekends, partner up in New Jersey. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And Dan, you take care of yourself. Both of you take care of yourself. And always, you know, always believe who we are. Always believe man. in who we are. It doesn't matter what people think. It's who we are. Yeah. It's what you believe, not what other people think. Right, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Well, again, that's what you, 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 you're left with yourself in your mind. But uh, no, this was uh, the MF Raging Bull at Yahoo.com. Manny Fernandez. Fantastic. Appreciate you being on Toxic Masculinity this evening there. And uh, we'll definitely make certain that uh, uh, we'll, we'll post that up. Uh, your email address in case anyone wants to book you for speaking engagements or whatever that at least they know how to get in contact with you just never know thank you man so, thank you very much thank you guys man you guys have a blessed day yes sir you all too. right take care thank you for watching another episode of dan and don's toxic masculinity you better like subscribe and share or i'm gonna come to your house